Hi everyone, welcome back to this series of PMP practice questions, specifically from the Pumbok Guide 7th edition, the latest edition of the Pumbok Guide, so the latest up-to-date project management body of knowledge. Very, very cool stuff. Also, these questions are scenario-based, very similar to what you will see on the PMP exam. Very tricky too in some situations, as we've been finding as we've been going through these. Uh, we've, we're doing 10 questions here. It's a great way to prepare, and I truly believe that you can pass the PMP exam with this practice and by learning a little bit every single day. Let's get into these questions. You're a project manager in an organization with a directive project management office and are currently in between projects. The PMO asks you to prepare for an upcoming project in the accounting area by meeting with the functional manager there. You have no team, no scope and no requirements and no timeline as yet. What will you do next? Okay, wow. Uh, let's see what we've got. Ask the functional manager for their wish, wish list of improvements so you can take these to your PMO. Okay, uh, I mean, maybe? Then we could maybe prioritize those. Um, I wonder if there's anything, any other better options here though. Create a project management plan so the project scope, budget, and schedule are more clear. I think we'll do that once we have kicked off the project and we can plan the project usually. Uh, before that stage, you know, there's no project in existence, so why do a plan necessarily? Create a small backlog of work and start your first sprint, then progressively update the backlog as the project progresses. That's like uh, an agile or an iterative approach. Uh, but you know, we still may need to do the planning and why are we doing this project in the first place? Uh, even though we've got a small backlog of work, I think you know, maybe we need a, something bigger than this, a vision, you know, a direction. Um, Let's put a low maybe on this one for now. Progressively elaborate the vision. Okay, there's our vision, That's, that could be good. Vision statement and project charter to kick off our project, also good, to define a coordinated approach. Okay, remember we're in the very early days here. You know, the project hasn't even been kicked off. To kick off a project, we do need a project charter or in an agile environment, a vision statement at the very least to find out where we are going then we can do all of these other things. Project plan, um, small backlog of work, and even you know, prioritizing a wish list of improvements as well. But for our purposes, I think, let's go with answer D. Excellent work, all right. Before initiating a project of any sort, we start with a vision statement, project charter, or business case in order to identify a coordinated path to achieve the desired outcomes. Page 52 under planning overview in the Pumbok Guide 7th edition. All right, nice one to start with. A Little bit of leadership, a little bit of vision. That's pretty good. Let's see what we have next. You're working on a project where part of the project delivers a high value, high risk component. Another part of the project delivers a routine change to the system, okay tricky. Uh, your project sponsor wants to gain the business quickly, the business value quickly, uh, but your project team want to start with the work that they're familiar with first. What will you do next? Gosh, okay. Uh, so we've got high value, high risk uh, components, and we've also got BAU work as well. So what do we do here? And people want to start with different things. Okay, prioritize the high risk items at the end of the project. Um, Okay, well, let's see what else we have. Prioritize the high risk items at the start of the project. Okay, uh, you know what, that actually sounds pretty good because that's, that, that's sort of a principle that we do. Try and uh, remove all of the high risk items first because the risk actually gets higher towards uh, the end of the project. So if we haven't delivered it, haven't delivered it, then it's actually the risk becomes higher and higher and higher because maybe we won't deliver it at all, or maybe it will impact something else right at the end of our project, which is a terrible scenario. So actually, that one could work. Let's see what else we have just in case. Use an incremental approach and deliver part of the routine and high risk work in each sprint. Uh, incremental, uh, I don't know, I think, because then we're doing increments and we're delivering one bit of this, one bit of that. Uh, you know what? If anything, I would look at more of a hybrid approach where some of this is agile and some of this is waterfall. So some of this is planned up front and some of this is, um, you know, is, uh, is released in increments or you know, at least iterated on so that we can get the feedback on it. Um, so I think 
No on that one for now. Plan out the work in detail and secure a scope baseline with formal change controls to reduce the uncertainty. Uh, I think that's probably gonna make the situation a little bit worse. So for us, based on that, let's get rid of those high risk items first, then work on our BAU stuff. Let's go with answer B. Excellent work. This question refers to the concept of last responsible moment. Well, that's something good to know. Work that is novel or risky can be prioritized at the start of the project to reduce uncertainty with the project scope before a large investment has been made. Routine work can be delayed until the further, cost of further delay would exceed the benefit. In other words, can we delay it as much as possible until uh, it's just gonna become too costly to delay that any further and that's when we need to do it. So that actually is pretty good. Page 54 in the Pumbok Guide under delivery, page paragraph three, uh, Pumbok Guide seventh edition, fantastic way to get us started on this. That was actually pretty good. All right, how did you guys go with that one? I think we're getting through these pretty well. Let's see what we have next. You are working on an agile project where the functional manager you're delivering to only has a high level idea of the system requirements that they'll need. The functional manager suggests a work breakdown structure. However, your team feel that that is more for a predictive or waterfall delivery approach. Oh, okay, what will you do next? So it says we're working on an agile uh, sort of project, uh, but does that mean that we can't use a work breakdown structure? Not necessarily, but you know, is there another way to put this or do this in an agile project? So decomposition is the, is the idea here, and it still applies whether we're working in this way or that way. So let's see what we've got. Create, uh, use and create a work breakdown structure anyway, as it's just a tool. I mean, maybe, maybe we do do that. Uh, I wonder if there's anything more agile centric though. Use rolling wave planning, that sounds promising, and keep the work at a high level until you're ready to work on it, and then you can plan in detail. That actually sounds pretty good. I mean, I put that as a, as a high maybe for that one as well. That one's a high maybe. Are these all gonna be good answers? I'm not sure. Note the high level themes or epics. Decom okay, there's that decomposition, um, that theme the principle of decomposition, we're decomposing things into smaller and smaller pieces. Decompose them into features and again into user stories. All right, that's a really good answer as well, especially because that's basically a work breakdown structure. We've got our high level themes, decompose them into features, and then again into multiple user stories for people to actually work on. Uh, that could be our one, uh, especially because it's more agile centric there. Uh, last one, use the functional, ask the functional area for more detailed requirements before the project begins. I think we want to collaborate with the functional area. We can't just ask them for it. You know, uh, we really have to work with people to you know, elaborate and extract these, these requirements. So all of these are pretty good, but the best one I think for us is answer C. All right, great work. This question refers to decomposition or breaking down the work. We could use a work breakdown structure or rolling wave planning, but for an incremental approach, breaking down the work from epics into features to user stories is a form of decomposition that fits the delivery approach that we're using. Page 54, under delivery, paragraph three again, in the Pumbaa Guide, seventh edition. Wonderful to know, you can check that out for yourself. How did you go with that one? A few good answers there, that was actually pretty good. All right, let's see what we have next. You're, you're at the beginning of a pl planning a new project and have researched and gathered the requirements from the area, broken them down into deliverables and activities, which you believe could take 26 weeks to deliver. Okay, well, we've done a lot of work here, this is good. The project sponsor is asking you for an estimate on how long the project will take. What will you do next? All right, tell the project sponsor 26 weeks. Hmm, is it that easy? Ah, uh, hmm, that seems pretty straightforward. We think 26 weeks. Oh, hang on a minute though. You're at the beginning of planning a new project. So we're right at the beginning here. We're not sort of even in the project at all. So potentially here, then we're, then we're you know, doing the planning uh, and then we're doing the delivering and then you know, ultimately the product is delivered. So we're like all the way back here at the very, very beginning. This is tricky because when we're estimating on things, uh, our estimates are really bad 
at the beginning and they get more honed, they get better and better and better as we get more knowledge and information as the project goes along. Um, uh, so that's something that we really need to be aware of. And not to mention, there's actually ranges. So now that I think about this more, uh, there's ranges at, you know, when it's really far away, it's like uh, minus 50% plus 75% or something similar is, they call it a rough order of magnitude. Uh, that, that's, you know, that's a rough guide at the beginning and it gets narrower and narrower. So then I think the budget estimate is minus 10 to plus 25 or something similar. Um, or, you know, and then maybe minus five to plus 10, something like that until ultimately it's delivered and the estimates are just zero because that's what it actually is. So all of that to say, tell the project sponsor that you'll use an iterative approach where value is delivered until the project stops. Uh, we still need to estimate it, I think. So we still need a rough guideline here to, you know, so that we know what we're dealing with. So let's put a no for now. Let's put a no on that one for now as well. Tell the project sponsor approximately 24 to 28 weeks. Okay, so we're right at the beginning. Uh, 26, what's 50% off that would be down to 13, wouldn't it? So is that enough? Not really, that's not quite enough. And plus 75%, not quite enough either. Uh, but the other one is tell the project sponsor approximately 20 to 45 weeks. So that is, that's minus something like, what, what is that, 25 minus, minus 25%? Hmm, okay, this is tricky. Uh, none of these match up with what we've done here. I, you know, this is, I don't really uh, remember them all exactly, but I think the biggest one, I think, is this last one. So this is the biggest range. Let's go with that and see how we go. Okay, answer D. This question is related to estimation and range. Estimates should have a broad range at the start of the project, just like we said, starting at, okay, minus 25 to plus 75. Oh, I was close. It was uh, 25 instead of 50 there. So that's good to know. When there is not much information, once the project team has a smooth delivery cadence and experience in the product, a smaller range, such as minus five to plus 10% can be used uh, a 0% range is when everything is known when the product has been delivered. So we were pretty close, oh, nearly, um, but you know, right on the right track and still managed to eliminate all the other ones based on that, so that's good. Uh, page 55 under estimating and range in the Pumbok Guide 7th edition. All right, a little bit trickier that one. How did you guys go? Did you beat me to it? Possibly. I was floundered a little bit there, so, uh, but we still got there in the end. <laughs> that was good. All right, we're nearly halfway through. After gathering your project requirements, project scope, and breaking it down into activities, you need to estimate the project schedule within your team, with your team. Okay, more estimation maybe? After some analysis and discussion, your team come up with a range of 53 to 75 days assigned across all tasks. What will you do next? Okay. Whew. And look at our answers here. It's, we've got accuracy and precision. Oh, this is a question on accuracy and precision. And I think we've done this before in the sixth edition, uh, Pumbok Guide, sixth edition questions. So accuracy and precision, uh, accuracy is the range. So if it's a small range, then it's high accuracy. Uh, if it's a wide range, so this is actually a pretty wide range. It's like nearly 20 days, more than 20 days here. Uh, and quite a big percentage of what we're looking at. So I think for us, the accuracy is actually quite low. It's quite wide range here. Uh, okay, and the precision is more about, you know, is it sometime next week or is it uh, specific this day, like Wednesday, or you know, in days or hours or minutes? Um, the precision is pretty good. So we're saying, you know, it's these, this amount of days. It's not saying, you know, sometime between now and November or whenever. Uh, okay, so low accuracy, that's this one. Uh, confidence and precision, that's not a real thing. So, oh, that's a little bit of a red herring. We can get rid of those. Um, but low accuracy and high precision ensure the estimates become more accurate as the project unfolds. And that's what we found as we get better at the project, the estimates become more accurate like we were looking at before. I think based on that, we can go with answer B. 
All right, excellent. This question is on estimates and their accuracy. The lower the accuracy, the larger the potential range in values, so big range, and that's what we're seeing. Precision is different from accuracy as it refers to the exactness of the estimate. How exact is it? For example, two days is more precise than sometime this week, and that is good to know. Pumbok Guide 7th edition, page 54 again, under estimating accuracy, precision, and confidence. How did you guys go with that one? That was actually pretty good. Getting a little bit trickier, but we're getting through them. You're doing a great job. Let's see what we've got next. You are working on a business case where you know that the industry is undergoing a significant change at the moment, and there could be many different impacts to your project benefits before it's delivered completely. Okay. Your project sponsor asks you to, uh, for the best estimate of benefits that you can give under the circumstances. What will you do next? Okay, wow, tricky. Uh, so there's gonna be lots of changes to our project and potentially to the benefits, but we have to estimate what the benefits are. Um, do, again, do we do that range? Do we do a range here? Uh, let's have a look at the options we have. Ask your team for a probabilistic estimate. So that is a range and it's a range with uh, estimates with probabilities attached to it. So maybe there's a 50% you know, chance of here. Maybe there's a, uh, maybe a 30% chance of this one. Maybe there's a 90% chance of this one. So that's actually pretty good and pretty handy. That could be what we're after. Let's see what else we have just in case. Ask your team for a deterministic estimate. Uh, I think that's a specific number. So it's we're determined about it, I think, a specific uh, number. Let's see, I, I would say a no for that one for now. Ask your team for an absolute estimate. Uh, maybe those two are similar, I'm not sure. But both of those sound very absolute and, and we're sort of changing, our environment's changing, so it's not gonna be the best. Ask your team for a relative estimate. That's more agile related, where we're uh, looking at the smallest piece and then estimating everything else as it relates to that first piece. For example, there's two bits in there, four bits in here, for example, you know, that sort of thing. And there's various ways to do that, obviously, uh, with Fibonacci you know, numbers and that sort of thing that you will see in the real world. That's your relative estimating, not particularly what we're after here. I think we're gonna go with answer A. All right, great work, guys. Probabilistic estimates include a range of estimates along with the associated probabilities within the range, such as a confidence level or a probability distribution, like your, so your cumulative distribution here, where you know, ultimately we get to 100%, or this is 0% here. And at this stage, we're going to have the highest probability. For example, so you know, this is just a, one example, cumulative distribution where we're accumulating over time. Uh, deterministic, uh, if, if the number is uncertain, that that's the best approach. Deterministic is a number. Absolute is specific. Okay, so we we're close. That's just a number. That's specific. Uh, and actual numbers and relative estimates are shown in comparison to other estimates. Page 57 under presenting estimates in the Pumbok Guide 7th edition. Wow, all right. Getting a little bit trickier, but still, I think we got there in the end. That was actually pretty good. I'm learning quite a little bit here as well. Uh, how did you guys go with that one? I think we're doing this. We're doing really well. Let's see what we have next. You have noted nine epics for delivery as part of your most recent project. Your team have broken down these epics into user stories and would like to see the effort involved for these deliverables. Okay, we're looking at effort again, potentially. You ask your team to find the smallest user story, size it with a one, and then determine the size of the other cards based on how they compare to the original card. Uh, oh, this is, uh, okay, a few things here. What approach are you taking? So this is the type of estimating. And we had a bit of a clue from the last one. It's not deterministic, it's like, so it is a number, that is fine but we're comparing, it's relative to the original card. It's that, so we've got one is a one, uh, then this one is going to be you know, uh, two, for example. Next one is gonna be a three, based on how big it is in relation to that first one. Uh, so what approach are we taking here? Oh, and there it is, relative estimating with your team. I think that's probably gonna be our one. Let's see what else we've got, just in case. Deterministic estimating to determine the effort uh, again, it's a, that's that specific number, I think, wasn't it? Um, absolute estimating was, uh, was just something absolute, a specific number again. 
Uh, that was a number and that was a specific one. <laughs> I get those mixed up. Probabilistic estimating is that probability that we used before, but it's not relative here. For us, it is relative estimating. Let's go with answer A. All right, excellent work. This question is about estimating and making an estimate in comparison to other estimates. That is relative estimating. Page 57 under relative estimating in the Pembroke Guide 7th edition. Wonderful work, guys. We're really getting through this, really, really doing it, learning a little bit that we can use in future questions as well. All right, let's keep going. You're working on a project where a competitor is also working on a similar feature and being first to the market will have a significant impact on this year's profit. Your product owner would like to measure how quickly story cards are being completed once they start being developed. Okay, what will you do next? Do we have anything on velocity here? Uh, although that's, velocity is for all of the story cards in a sprint, for example. Um, but this is, so just how quickly story cards are being completed in general once they start being developed. Okay, and I see we've got lead time, cycle time. Uh, check the Gantt chart. I, don't, I think that's gonna throw us off. That's not it. Check the schedule network and precedence diagram. That's gonna throw us off as well. So we've got either the lead time or the cycle time. The lead time is from the time the customer makes the order. So for our purposes, it might be from when the feature makes its way into our backlog and then to the time it is delivered to the customer or released, uh, so into production, for example. So that's the lead time, that's the full time. But in between, we might have different story cards being completed and that is our cycle time. The cycle time is when a developer starts picking it up uh, and then completes their work. That's the cycle time for their work. So all of that to say, I think our answer here is gonna be answer C. Excellent work, all right. Cycle time is the total elapsed time. It takes one unit to get through a process or just their process. Lead time is the time from when the customer makes the order or the requirement is noted to the time that the item is delivered or released. Well, that's pretty much exactly what we were saying, so that's really, really good news. Schedule network diagram is useful for finding the critical path and precedence diagramming is used to find what deliverable or activity relies on other activities. Page 58 under flow-based estimating in the Pumba Guide 7th edition. That was pretty good, all right. You know what else is pretty good? We are down to the last two questions. You've done an amazing job. Let's keep going, we're nearly, nearly there. You're working on a project that has recently moved to a more agile way of work. The team have not completely taken on the Scrum approach, however, and are comfortable working with a more flow-based approach, you are moving user stories across a Kanban board. So flow-based is that Kanban approach that we saw before. You're wanting to get an estimate on how much work can be completed in the next three months based on the team's existing process, uh, progress. What will you do next? Wow, okay. So we're just using flow-based scheduling. It's a pull approach where someone pulls the work usually onto the Kanban board. Once they're ready, uh, there's usually a work in progress limit. So we can only have one or two in progress at, at one time per person. So they're not having to switch between tasks all the time. Uh, so that reduces that you know, cognitive load, that context switching so that you know, people can really, really focus. Uh, but because we're doing that, okay, multiply the velocity by the number of remaining user stories. That's more of a scrum way of work. Oh, here we go. Multiply the cycle time by the throughput. Cycle time is that time for each user story to be complete. So maybe it takes three days, for example, on average, and multiply that by the, the throughput. So how many of these are we getting completed you know, every uh, every week or so, or you know, every every month, for example, um, and so then that gives us a really good idea on how much uh, progress we're making and how much work can be completed in the next three months based on that, uh, and that's for your Kanban approach. Really similar to the Scrum approach, but just a little bit different there. Multiply the lead time by the schedule performance index. That's a red herring trying to throw us off. Multiply the planned value by the actual value. That's our earned value management that we will see 
uh, and relevant for other scenarios, but not this one in particular. For our purposes, let's go with answer B. There it is. Scrum uses velocity. Kanban or flow-based estimates are developed by determining the cycle time and throughput. Cycle time is the total elapsed time it takes one unit to get through a process. Throughput is the number of items that can complete a process in a given amount of time. Okay, goodness. All right, so to complete that feature, for example. All right, that's pretty good to know. Page 58 under flow-based estimating, if you want to check that out in more detail for yourself, which I do recommend, that's pretty good. And you can go directly there to the Promote Guide. Fantastic. How did you guys go with that one? You're up to the last question. You're doing an amazing job. Let's do this. Your product owner wants to bring the next feature forward so that it is done in parallel to the current feature. Okay, fast tracking perhaps? So we're doing things in sequence and now we want to do them at the same time to make things go a little bit faster. Um, but it's still released in the existing feature order. Oh, okay. So it's a little, this one's still coming first. This one is released a little bit afterwards perhaps. You make the necessary adjustments to the product backlog and decide to adjust the product roadmap, which you have visualized as a Gantt chart. So product backlog is our list of features. So which features are prioritized first, for example, so we can reprioritize those accordingly. Uh, and then we can put them on our Gantt chart, which is, you know, looks like this, just bars on a chart as they're, uh, you know, going on a schedule. Uh, so what are we going to do next? How are we going to make this happen? And I see we've got leads and lags here. Okay, this is good. Leads and lags. So lagging is when it's moving backwards. It's lagging behind. Leading is when we're leading it forward. So we're leading the item back, you know, forward to us. Where that's we're using the lead that we have available. Um, and so. He wants to bring it forward, so we're leading it forward, remember? So let's have a look. Use a schedule lead. So we've got either A or C here, because we're using a schedule lead. And, oh, okay, change the feature to finish to start. So this is precedence diagramming. So the precedence diagramming method, where we've got finish to start, start to start, start to finish, and uh, there's another one there. I think there's only four, so yeah. Uh, so. The way we do this, this is a little trick as well, is uh, the second item can't start before the first item has finished, and so on. So the second item can't start before the first item has started. The second item can't finish before the first item has finished. So that's your little trick to use when you see precedence diagramming method. So our second item for us still has to be in the same order. So it can't finish before the first item has finished. Like we were saying here, there's still that, still the same order, isn't it? Um, but it can start before the first one has finished. We actually want it to start so that it's ready to go based on all of that information. So I think this is gonna be our one. Uh, answer C, we can finish, uh, the second one can't finish before the first one finishes but we can bring it forward and start it so that it is ready to go. <laughs> All right, I hope we got this right. Let's see, answer C. Okay, good work guys, <laughs> excellent. Uh, schedule lag is moving an item back. Schedule lead is bringing an item forward. Precedence diagramming method states for finish to finish items, the next item cannot finish until the previous item has finished. This allows the items to be worked on in parallel while still keeping the same delivery order. Well, that was actually pretty tricky. And we've got page 59, Schedules, Lead and Lag in the seventh edition. And we've got page 180, Precedence Diagramming Method uh, in the sixth edition of the PMBOK Guide. So both of those, really good books. Definitely do recommend you go through them. They're fantastic tomes of information. And what else is fantastic is that you and I have gotten through this little section of PMP questions, specifically on the PMBOK Guide seventh edition. So the, that latest information, you're doing a wonderful job. I truly believe that you can pass the PMP exam. Keep practicing, keep learning a little bit every single day, and I know you can do it. I hope to see you in the next video. Bye for now.